Hey everyone, this is going to be a quick little overview of the Ottoman Empire and basically their response to the age of the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to be looking back at how other places around the world will respond to what's been happening in Europe uh, over the next week or two. And something to understand for, for this region, the Ottoman Empire and its decline and what's happening with regard to their relationship with Europe is that you need to understand the historical context. Uh, the background here is that, you know, as we get further into the 19th century, people are moving, you know, further and further along the road towards industry. And it wasn't just Europeans, as we'll see uh, next week. The Japanese are getting into the game. Russia is industrializing, of course, the United States. And uh, so more machines, more modernization is happening. And a byproduct of that is that they, all these nation states and all of these societies and economies that are industrializing, they, of course, need the raw materials for their um, industrial economies to make the goods, for example, rubber to make tires for cars. That's why the Congo was so important to Leopold, because it was just this huge, uh, you know, basically bank or resource for rubber trees. And uh, so that's why it was so important to him. Um, but they will also, all these nations uh, will also need markets to sell their goods. And all of this is very driven by the idea of, you know, competition and nationalism and, and, you know, our nation is the best and our nation state has to be, you know, on top and supreme. And so that's, important for us to kind of really set the historical context here is to understand what's going on around the world and how that impacts uh, the Ottoman Empire. So first of all, when we talk about nationalism, you need to understand that basically that means, you know, nationalism means that you have a loyalty or devotion to a nation state above, you know, a religious ideology or above a monarch or an individual. You have there's loyalty to the nation. And so this comes along with the idea that, you know, you exalt one nation above others, you place emphasis or promote your own culture, your own national interests uh, against other nations. And you see yourself in the, you know, us versus them, our country or our nation is better than, than yours kind of ideology. And also that a nation is really made up of some commonalities. And then, you know, this is this new idea of nationalism kind of goes against all of the centuries of history that we've been studying up to this point where there's these great large uh, empires with multilinguistic, you know, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic peoples residing in them. And you know, there's there's still an allegiance to the empire, the emperor. And oftentimes there's a religious affiliation or a philosophical foundation like in China. But that's different than 19th century nationalism, where you really are looking at one group of people that have a common language. They all speak the same. They're all Italian or they're all speaking German or Turkish or whatever. They all read the same newspaper. They all have a, a common history. Um, and, and all of that is what kind of makes up a nation state or, or, you know, combines to make up nationalism. And the idea, you know, previewing our next unit, the idea of extreme nationalism, which we'll get into when we look at Mussolini and Stalin and Hitler, um, you know, that, or even before that, when we get into World War I, there's this great nationalist competition between France and Germany, you, uh, a recently a unified Germany, Great Britain, Russia, which is going to lead to this cataclysmic uh, conflict that's going to basically bring in uh, all of the nations of the world. But stay tuned for that. And so here is, uh, you know, going back to the height of the Ottoman Empire, here's a map. You can kind of see uh, where the Ottoman Empire was in relation to uh, Europe, but you can also see kind of, if you go back to the 16th, uh, all the way back to the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries here, how the growth of the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, started to encapsulate the, you know, the Middle East and Anatolia and Southeast, and got, went into Southeastern Europe. They laid siege to Vienna, et cetera, et cetera. And they're on the grow, you know, they're on the, uh, the rise. They're growing. They're conquering. You know, they're under the Suleiman the Magnificent, et cetera. But you know, as the 18th century 
uh, you know, produces this new era of rise of, of Europe and the rise of European mercantile economies. And then into the, into the 19th century with industrialization, we start to see that, um, that the Ottoman Empire is slowly, slowly, slowly in decline. We're going to take a look at why that is and what the history around that uh, was and what the Ottomans try to do to reform and try to modernize and try to keep up with the rest of the Europe. But um, by, you know, big takeaway here is by the 1800s, the Ottomans are in serious trouble and they're starting to lose a lot of their territory and they're, they're starting to be outpaced by the rest of the world. So let's just quickly review some of the things that we've already learned about the Ottomans. Go back to our uh, November, December uh, unit where we were looking at uh, gunpowder empires. We've talked about how, remember, in 1453, they're conquering Constantinople. They remake it. Istanbul uh, It's kind of you know, a big turning point, obviously, in, uh, in world history because that was the motive for uh, Europeans to find a quicker, cheaper trade route around uh, uh, the Middle East, and et cetera, and the rest is history, as they say. And, and, and during this time, the, the Ottomans, as we said, were kind of on the rise. They're threatening Europe. They're encroaching on southeastern European areas. Um, you need to remember that, of course, they're Islamic. They were mostly Sunni Muslims, but there are also lots of different other religions, Judaism, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Catholicism, lots of diversity with regard to their uh, religious makeup, but it was a Islamic state ruled by a sultan. Uh, and uh, what else? You need to remember they were they were a gunpowder empire, a very powerful gunpowder empire, empire for the you know the time period in the 16th century. We talked about remember Mehmet the conquerors, the one that uh, conquers constant you know Constantinople in 1453. Before him, Osman is the founder. Um, Ottomans take their name from Osman. Um, and then, uh, you know, Suleiman the Magnificent, the greatest of the uh, sultans during the rise of the Ottoman state. And we talked all about uh, him. And we talked about the Devshirme system that he implemented, Suleiman into, implemented that, you know, hopefully this is coming back to you. When <laughs> basically the Devshirme was with, you know, they found young Christian boys in the Balkans and other regions, usually Christians from communities that, you know, were on the periphery of the empire. And essentially had them uh, enslaved and, and raised in the, the Ottoman state and converted to uh, Islam. And they would kind of be sent to work in the bureaucracy within the government uh, of the Ottoman state, or maybe they'll be, you know, go down the route to work when, you know, in the military, being part of the elite Janissary Corp. And then we see that uh, the leader of this is a, as we said, a sultan uh, who, kind of traces their roots back to the original caliphs, or at least that's what they claim. And they were, you know, you need to remember they were an extremely diverse empire. They were multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious, as we said. They were Turks. The core of the of the state or of the civilization was Turkish, but they also kind of, you know, meld and adapt different, uh, you know, cultural ideas in that in that Middle Eastern region, particularly Arabic cultural ideas and writing and language. So there starts to be some reasons for the decline of the Ottoman uh, Empire. Oftentimes, the Ottoman Empire is referred to as, quote, the sick man of Europe. And so the reason for that is that they're, you know, they're on the periphery of Southeastern Europe and other countries that, you know, are modernizing, industrializing, the Ottomans are in the 1800s and in early 1900s are basically being left behind to a certain extent. And so that's why they're kind of sometimes referred to as the sick man of Europe or when European writers or European politicians are getting together, they'll sometimes refer to the Ottomans as the quote, Eastern question quote, you know, like so what to do with that cousin that we're all embarrassed about or whatever, or what the problems that are being caused in, in, in that region because they can't keep, uh, control of their territory and so on. So either the sick man of Europe or the Eastern question. Um, but, and they are, you know, connected to Europe. They're not really in Europe. They're kind of born in the Middle East. And so, um, you know, we start to see them kind of separate and they're not really keeping pace with their European peers. One, they're not industrializing. And so they're, they're competing with new economies that are 
um, you know, not far from where their home is. And so that's causing a, a big problem for them and causing uh, some difficulties and, and one of the reasons for their decline. Two, they're having financial issues. They're having a hard time developing revenue. They used to be, you know, on top of the world. They used to be right in the middle of everything and Silk Road Network and going through Istanbul, all the all eastern lucrative trade routes that they controlled. People would come through. They could tax them. But now in the 18th and 19th century, trade and uh, commerce is a lot more sea-based. And so there's kind of a decline in use of the Silk Road. And this is going to cause financial distress for the Ottoman state. Not only the Ottomans, but this is also a reason for the decline of the Safavid and the Mughals as well. And so, you know, if you have less money, that's going to cause problems because it's harder to run your government programs and it's harder to maintain uh, military control of your territory and your borders and, you, you know, your, the infrastructure and the bureaucracy, it's, it's going to be an issue if you don't have enough funds to run, to run this enormous state that they had developed. And, uh, and as a result of that, they're beginning to lose a lot of territory. And a lot of this uh, kind of goes with people that decide that they want their own nation. As we talked about nationalism before, they feel like they have a different, you know, that they are unique and they have a different ethnic group or a different uh, national consciousness than the old, you know, multi-ethnic Ottoman empires. So there's this new idea. There's this new consciousness. You know, so this is this would be good contextualization. Just like the Enlightenment in Western Europe and the Americas was kind of this contagious you know, domino effect. Well, now nationalism is beginning to infect and spread and you know, wear your mask you'll, or you'll catch nationalism uh, into the Ottoman state. So there's a lot of questioning about how, um, you know, what does it really mean to be Ottoman and what is what does an Ottoman national identity look like? And uh, finally, the you know, another problem for the Ottomans is that the Janissaries, this great elite military you know, feared and revered fighting force, they're starting to obviously lose their military edge. They were once, you know, the, the you know, the most advanced fighting machine with, you know, they, these cannoneers and these musket infantrymen, and they were fierce on the battlefield and extremely loyal and uh, something to be admired and feared. Well, now they're, you know, with industrialization, we see the modernization of weaponry and Europe is outpacing uh, the elite Janissary Corps. The Europeans are developing modern machine guns. Remember the Maxim machine gun. Whatever happens, fear not. We've got the Maxim gun. They have not. The new infield rifles, more advanced artillery, more well-funded standing armies. You know, of course, the more advanced ironclad, steam-powered naval warships. These, you know, huge juggernaut warships. So. So basically, the Ottomans are in this rough spot in uh, the 19th century. Uh, there's a major technology and military gap um, compared to those in Europe. And so they're starting to become less and less powerful. They're not the elite people that conquered Constantinople in 1453. Uh, and people were worried about them and how much they would, would uh, encroach on Europe. So if you look at this map, you can kind of see the different areas of the Ottoman Empire. We see by the eve of World War I, 1914, the Ottoman Empire really was just essentially like Turkey, uh, kind of the old Mesopotamian area. We still see them going down into the Holy Land, into Mecca, modern day Yemen, a little bit along the Persian Gulf. And uh, that kind of was their empire. But it it used to be all of those other areas um, and you can kind of see, if you look at the, they lost the Crimea to Russia in the Crimean War. Russia needed a warm water seaport. Um, so they defeat, you know, they take that away from the Ottomans. Um, they eventually lose all these reddish areas here, Bosnia, Romania, uh, Greece, they lose. The Greek independence movement was greatly uh, written about by romantic poets and romanticism movement in, in Europe cheered on that, you know, Greece was kind of the foundation of Western civilization. So they wanted to see it free from Muslim Ottoman uh, control. Uh, we look at the purple areas eventually. Uh, they lose these. Egypt uh, asserts their independence. Of course, the British entanglements arising from the Suez Canal developments that we talked about pulls them 
further and further away from Ottoman control. Uh, you know, also, of course, the Muhammad Ali asserting his own independence. But then when the British get involved, really, the Ottomans kind of have said goodbye to Egypt. So we start seeing these different areas gain their independence from the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire continues losing territory all the way up to World War I in the next period. So how do they attempt to modernize? How do the Ottomans modernize? Let's look at some of the reforms that the Ottomans did try to, uh, to make to keep up with the Europeans and not fall terribly too far behind them. First early Ottoman reforms are, are going to be led by Sultan Salim III. And he's going to move the Ottoman Empire towards industry. He's going to use European loans. Uh, but keep in mind, loans are always tricky because they come with interest. And, they're, you know, remember what happened with Egypt and if they can't pay back. Then that gives the, the creditors a little foothold into the territory. So that could become a problem. And it does become a problem later on, as we'll see. But uh, he gets the loans. Uh, Salim the Third. He gets the loans from Europe because it's expensive to start industrializing, and there's going to be some uh, some some investment needed in order to get the ball uh, going there. So, in addition, there's also some uh, some new law codes that are written and established by Salim. And uh, one of the major things to note is that it's it's going to focus less. These laws are going to focus less on Sharia law. Um, or like the Islamic law, basically. So this is going to make, you know, people imagine changing overnight Islamic Sharia law that had been around for centuries and centuries. That's going to make a few people mad. And it's obviously all of these modernizations are going to obviously make the military mad. The the you know these conservative janissaries who think they're these you know this great historical fighting force when they're trying to modernize and do away with some of the old fighting techniques and styles of the Janissaries. And so their Janissaries are a little resistant to this because they want to kind of keep with tradition and, you know, the military tradition. And so that's a, a problematic thing for them. Um, and then the last group that really kind of fights against the change are these, you know, very religious Islamic scholars known as the ulama. And they're, of course, very orthodox and very conservative and extremely resistant to change in, in the Ottoman society. And so, you know, Salim attempts these modernizations, but it ultimately doesn't end well for him. He's overthrown in 1807 and eventually killed. But we do start to see that, you know, at the beginning of the 1800s, the Ottomans recognize their position, they they start to recognize their problems, and we see that they're you know they're trying to figure out how they can move forward in this era. So then we have another guy, Sultan Mahmoud II, and he's like, all right, we're really going to tackle modernizing and really going to modernize the military. Which sounds like you know if we have a stronger military, that we can be a stronger force, and we can use that. Uh, geopolitically to our advantage, help help other aspects of society and the economy, our government. And so he wants to use European weaponry and he wants to have a stronger military force. And this is actually kind of a you know weird parallel with what's going on in Japan is they're you know fighting against the traditional samurai Bushido culture and in the mid 1800s trying to 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 grapple with uh, you know, modernizing and becoming this new industrial state. We're going to look at Japan in the next uh, couple periods where we look at how, you know, they grapple with this, this uh, you know, in, in the face of these new Western industrial uh, economies and pow military powers, how do they adapt? How do they reform? But there's a lot of, I would say there's a lot of comparisons. If I was writing the AP exam, I would totally compare the Ottoman modernizations and reforms to the Japanese. I think there's a lot of similarities there. Anyway, so, um, Salim wants to have this modern military and uh, you know, basically wants to modernize. He wants to be more European, so much so that he decides the main obstacle in the way is the Janissaries. He, the, this core is resistant to change. And so like what he does is he basically, there's this kind of auspicious incident that he basically massacres. He calls together all of the Janissaries and he you know, slaughters them, sort of like... Uh, 
uh, you know, the Justinian does after the Nika revolts. He, he slaughters all the rebels. Well, Salim slaughters and kills off all, you know, in one day massacres the Janissary Corps. You know, hundreds of thousands of them or thousands of tens of thousands of them and uh, without any mercy. And basically at the snap of a finger, essentially in one day, he eliminates 500 years of this elite group, this elite Janissary uh, core. And so this is a major turning point in Ottoman history uh, as they eliminate the Janissaries to become more like the Europeans. And so that after this, there are these three different kinds of reform movements that take place in the Ottoman Empire. Three different actions or movements taking place sometimes at the same time. And one of them is known as the Tanzimat reforms. And the Tanzimat reforms, Tanzimat literally means reorganization. They want to get rid of the capitulations that they were giving to Europe. Capitulations are basically like if you're a European or a Westerner and you went to the Ottoman Empire, you're exempt from different Ottoman laws and you could go there and maybe you didn't have to follow the law, what the legal standing was or whatever. You were exempt. You know, you had some kind of special privilege. They called them capitulations. And so, you know, in addition, you would have tax exemptions. And this is kind of a big deal if you could go there and do business and not have to pay their taxes. And so the Ammans say, hey, we, we need to get rid of this. Uh, and so the Tanzimat reforms, they're like, we're going to get rid of these special privileges for Europeans. Some of this is based on the fact that they, you know, they're, they're more into industry. They're based on these European loans and maybe they're having to pay interest and they start you know, gathering kind of this blackmail-like situation where the Europeans could do what they want because the Ottomans owed them a lot of interest for these loans. So it's getting, you know, kind of uh, tricky. Also in the Tanzimat reforms, they begin to get, remember, Ottomans were extremely diverse society. And so they start um, becoming a little bit more enlightened, I would say. They get start giving non-Muslims equal rights, uh, which again was going to obviously anger some strict, orthodox, conservative, religious uh, Muslims, right? And and if you embed that into the law code and you make everyone equal, that means, you know, people are starting to have to look at and say, well, well, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not equal to this lowly Christian or this lowly Jew. I'm, you know, I am a, a Muslim Turk. And so that obviously angered some people. And so the question that they're all fighting over is what does it mean to be Ottoman? Like if I said, I'm Ottoman, what is my commonality and who are our people? And so we have two different groups that emerge out of this. And this is where I'll conclude today. Two different groups of people that are going to you know, lean a little more Turkish and secular and other another group who are going to lean a little bit more towards modernization, but kind of want to stick with their true Muslim roots. So the first group were the would be the young Ottomans. They were called the, they called themselves the young Ottomans. And they're really influenced by the French Revolution, by European style democratic systems. They want to basically blend Islam and modernism. So the young Muslims, I'm sorry, the young Ottomans are into Islamic modernism. Young Ottomans, Islamic modernism. Uh, they embrace, you know, scientific innovations that were coming out during this period, building on the scientific revolution that happened in Europe. But there's they're still going to want to maintain or they still wanted to maintain their strong Islamic beliefs. It's not going to be separate. It's going to be one and the same. They didn't see a conflict between, you know, their their religion and modernization, right? So they're essentially saying our identity as Ottomans is the fact that we are Muslims, but we can still modernize. And so those those two ideologies can work together. Sultan Hamid II will accept this constitution by the people, like very similar to the French Revolution, but the but they'll later suspend it and then go even further to be like an absolute ruler. So it wasn't terribly successful, but we do see some movement movement there. So big takeaway: young Ottomans equals Islamic modernism. Now the other group were known as the Young Turks. And the Young Turks uh, were quite a different group. They really are going to focus, you know, they're, they're going to oppose Hamid II, and they're really going to focus on their Turkish Turkishness, right? And using, instead of uh, Islam as a unifying element, uh, their Turkish ethnicity 
uh, for a unifying element. And uh, and so if they're saying, what does it look like to be Ottoman? They would say, it looks Turkish. We're Turkish. And so we see this nationalism coming back and building on this. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about nationalism. Well, they would use their Turkish identity as opposed to a unifying uh, Islamic or religious uh, um, element. And so what's unique about them is that they are, unlike the young Ottomans, they're going to be more secular. Secular meaning non-religious or non-Islamic. And they fight for new things such as universal suffrage, which means everybody gets the right to vote, at least men, sorry, ladies. Uh, voting, you know, equality between different classes. They believed in free education, freedom of religion, secularization, and non in religious influences on the government. They would totally have, have believed in the se you know, separation of church and state. They did believe in that. They believed in uh, you know, religions to stay out of the law codes. The laws should not be based on Islam. They believed in women's rights. Um, they believed that women should be able to wear westernized clothing. Um, so all of these things the young Turks are pushing for. Now, when they go home at the end of the day, it's important to realize, are the young Turks still Muslim? Yes, of course, they're still absolutely Muslim, but they're they're saying that basically there should be a separation of religious beliefs from, from law codes and government and that kind of thing. And so, um, but the big takeaway here uh, for the young Turks is that they believe that society should be very Turkish. And, um, and so they do get a lot of popular support. They do gain control after the turn of the century. Uh, and by 1908, we're going to see how uh, their influences are really going to uh, create the, the modern uh, nation of Turkey after it becomes independent, after the, spoiler alert, uh, Ottomans lose World War I. And we'll look at how Turkey comes out of that. And so they're the ones that kind of lay that foundation. And so to wrap up, you see the struggle in the Ottoman Empire, struggle to answer the question, who are we? What does it mean to be Ottoman in this new age of nationalism? And how are we going to keep up with Europeans? And what does that mean for our society? So, okay. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you soon.